Great. All right. I think we're all good to go. All right. So before I get us started, um, quickly remind us of our community agreements, take space, make space for other people. Um, please turn off your mic, unmute unless you have something to say. Feel free to use the chat for questions or comments. Um, be careful about the tone that you're using. We have zero, zero tolerance for um, hate speech or prejudice or um, any hateful language of any kind. And I think those are the most important ones that we'll talk about today. But um, yeah, feel free to interact with Craig as he goes through his presentation, uh, use the chat. And um, Craig, maybe you can tell us do you prefer that people hold off questions to the end or are you okay with people um, interjecting while you're talking? No, I'm fine with interjecting. And uh, I'm, I'd like to, you know, just do a brief introduction to who oh, I am. Yeah, please. And then also, uh, I mean, I, I know the three of you, but I, I don't know any of the other folks. So I, and I'll try to make it as brief as possible so we can just jump right into it. Uh, so. Uh, again, my name is Craig Willingham. I'm the managing director for the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. Um, I oversee all of our various projects, including our uh, counter marketing research. And um, my colleague, Sharita, uh, this particular workshop came at a, a, a unique time, and that uh, Sharita's been with the Institute for uh, five and a half years. And uh, this happened to uh, come at a time when she was transitioning to another position. So I agreed to step in and do the second part of the workshop. I'm looking forward to uh, talking about counter marketing and predatory marketing today. And also just as a footnote, I, I used to work for Grow NYC years ago. Uh, oh. Fantastic organization. I you know, really enjoyed my time there and uh, have friends that, you know, still friends to this day over 10 years ago. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to, at any time when I'm able to do any sort of work or help Grow NYC in any, any way. So if, uh, with that in mind, uh, if some of the folks who joined, uh, like I said, I know to, to Jessica and Corey, if you could just briefly introduce yourself, uh, tell me your name and uh, your connection with Grow NYC. So I'm gonna call on folks since I'm looking. So I'm gonna start with Angela. Right, Angela, you're muted. Okay, thank you. The slogan for uh, our lives now. Uh, hi, Craig, um, Angela Davis. I'm the new director of Retail Food Access and Agriculture. Uh, just started about a month ago. Um, and uh, we might've met over the years because I've definitely come to different events uh, at the at the um, at CUNY. Um, but I recently, most recently was working for the Jersey City Department of Health and Human Services um, as the director of the Food and Nutrition Division. And uh, before that, I actually worked for Just Food um, for almost 10 years, um, overseeing their um, food education programs. Got it. Uh, nice to meet you again, Angela. Yes, we have met before under a number of different circumstances. Right. I remember your name and face, but it's, it's a pleasure to, to see you again. Yeah, good seeing you again as well. Uh, next up, Medina. Hi, how are you? Hey Medina, do you would you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about, about what you do at Grow NYC? Oh, yeah. So um, I'm Medina. I'm 18. I'm currently enrolled in college, and I've been working with, but I've been working here for not so long. It's been less than a month, I believe. So I'm here as one of the the youth. Great. Thank you. Next up, Aether. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Athir. Athir, sorry. Maybe you're you're muted if you're if you're talking uh. Okay, I see you put a message up. Athir has been working with Grow NYC for two months. All right, thank you. Next up, Giselle. No problem, Athir. Thank you. All 
All right. Sal's been working with the farm stand for a little bit as well. Thank you. Tenzila. Um, hi, my name is Tenzila, and I've been working as a farm stand youth member for the past two months as well. Thank you. Shazaya. I'm not sure if you're talking and muted or you want to type in the chat. Yeah, Josiah was having some issues getting into the room. I'm not sure if he's still having some tech issues as well or not. Okay, well, we'll come back. If, you, uh, have, if we have some time and you can uh, introduce yourself briefly. And last but not least, uh, Fatu Mata. Maybe you're talking and muted. And if not, you can put something in the chat if you feel more comfortable doing that. Great, thank you. Well, nice to meet everyone. And I'm, I'm happy to uh, see so many people on a, a Tuesday afternoon uh, come to hear a talk about predatory marketing. And I'm gonna jump right into it and be respectful of your time. And I know last session you talked uh, more pointedly about food marketing and counter marketing from a general perspective. But in today's workshop, what I wanna do is talk a little bit more specific about uh, food marketing and counter marketing on a community level. And we're gonna talk uh, in a very uh, intentional way about a specific type of uh, targeted marketing known as predatory marketing. So uh, next slide, please. So some of the activities here, I think, you know, since we're virtual, uh, perhaps don't work quite as well as they would in a setting where we're face to face. But uh, for anyone who feels like responding, I, I, I'm curious, uh, how do you think food marketing impacts what you eat? And um, which food company do you think has the most appealing or convincing marketing and why? I mean, I'll, I'll start. So I think food marketing impacts what we eat uh, in many ways. You know, if you're walking around your neighborhood and you see advertisements for soda all the time, you're gonna get the impression that drinking soda, buying soda, uh, messages that promote soda is a, a very natural and organic part of your experience in your day to day. And, that can go a long way towards uh, changing your perception around what you what you buy, you know why you buy it, et cetera, if you see something as sort of a given. Um, and with respect to uh, food companies that uh, are the most appealing and convincing uh, marketing and why, one of the things I, I always point out is, you know, little Caesars pizza and, and other pizza places that you know have these, two pizzas for $10 deals that you see. I mean, I'm a vegan. I have been a vegan for over 20 years. But when I see those ads, I feel almost obliged to buy two pizzas. It seems like too good of a deal to pass up. It's, it's just, it has an a, insanely uh, deep appeal to I think anyone who's in any way cost conscious. When you see something uh, as, as cheap as that, two large pizzas for $10, I mean, just on principle, I feel like I should buy it even though I never do. But I think, that's using price as a way to hook people in and to you know, really sort of elevate products, your products above the others, I think goes a long way, even for people who normally wouldn't be your, your target audience. I'm curious if anyone else has any thoughts about any of these two questions. Um, I feel like product placement, especially as I get closer to like checkout open effects, what I'm, what I'm going to buy because I'm I don't usually walk in thinking I need chocolate it's probably like I need something else and then I'm standing in line for a while I'm like maybe I need chocolate so product placement I think is um very strategic and I think for me it open affects me too yeah you know one of the sort of strategies for um curbing you know impulse buys when you go grocery shopping people always say don't go grocery shopping hungry 
And I, I can attest to that being a really, uh, really poor factor in, in, or a really strong factor in driving poor decisions. If I go grocery shopping hungry, I'll start buying stuff, pulling stuff off the shelves that really aren't, aren't groceries. Just think, I, cause I want to eat everything because I'm hungry. And um, so it, it pays not to, not to be hungry when you go grocery shopping and those impulse buys uh, that you see at the checkout are also things that really sort of prey on, on your taste when you're really hungry. Anyone else have any thoughts or comments regarding these two questions? I, I find it interesting that uh, sometimes you see a deal like buy two for $10, but then if you are buying only one, the price difference is not that different. Like sometimes it's gonna be 4.99, 4.99 for one and then two for 10, which is exactly what you would pay if you bought only one, uh, which is also, I think, a marketing trick that goes behind selling larger amounts, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, outside of food, the famous uh, pillow company, My Pillow, you know, they have this deal where you get two for one, but it's actually the same price if you buy one. Uh, but they're known for their, you know, you're able to get two pillows for one. So yeah, the, those those sort of bait and switch marketing techniques are, you know, can be very effective in making you believe that you're actually saving money. Any other thoughts before we move on? I also thought about like sizes of, of, of beverages. Like I remember like, I mean, when I used to go to the movies, it was actually like cheaper to buy like the, the bigger sizes. And I also remember they used to call it child size to almost make you feel like, you know, like that's for a child, which I actually thought wasn't really for a child. And then like, if you were an adult, it would make you feel like self self-conscious about that. But um, so that's, I think is another was, was sort of an interesting kind of marketing technique as well. Absolutely. And, and another phenomenon that I, I've noticed uh, in the last few years is that places getting rid of smalls. So you just buy a medium or large, but they actually shrunk the medium and the large. So you're getting less in each of those. But it gives you the impression that, you know, you're really sort of, they're being very generous because they only offer mediums and larges. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's on, that, on that same continuum of uh, both appealing to size and price sensitivity for consumers. Yeah. And I'm not sure if it's correct, but I, I read somewhere that the portion size has also increased over the years. But, you know, the, the sort of, well, this is a phenomenon in the last year. So the ironic thing, maybe you've noticed this as well during the pandemic and, and you know the sort of i don't know what we would call this middle pandemic period portion sizes and serving sizes have actually gotten smaller in a lot of products i've noticed with a lot of products that i buy the packaging has gotten smaller and the sizes mm -hmm. have gotten smaller because you know companies are looking for ways to generate more income so um so yeah it, it's <laughs> it, it's counter the trend of the last 20 or so years with uh portion sizes getting larger I've noticed that with yogurt, they have, I think it's like Dan and yogurt, they have space at the top that they actually market now for space to put in like granola or other add-ons. And they're like giving you less, but like trying to pitch it as a benefit to you. It's really funny. Yeah. And in, in many cases, raise prices as well, giving you less. Yeah. yeah. So I just by these few examples that, uh, some of the folks in the audience have thrown out. I mean, we get a sense of all these different marketing techniques and the way in which they can appeal to us and the way we both notice them, but also the ways in which perhaps for the, in the example, when, when I'm when I said shopping, when I'm hungry, that we don't notice them. And, you know, those are some of the things that are going to be uh, features of what we're going to discuss today. So next slide, please. So here's a re quick recap of some of the things that you discussed last workshop. Um, beverage companies use a wide range of strategies and approaches to get people to buy their products from you know, market, using celebrities to market their products to and price, price deals to market their products to you know, having the, their branding on uh, sporting events, you name it. And you know, those sorts of things, again, create a sense in our heads that these things are everywhere and they're part of the uh, natural uh, way in which we uh, engage with the consumer environment, part of the natural buying behavior uh, when it comes to the things that we buy. 
And we know that uh, black and brown communities are typically, typically see more unhealthy marketing compared to white communities. And that, you know, uh, African-American and Latino youth are targeted the most with unhealthy food marketing. And what counter-marketing does is provide a moral framework to the sort of targeted marketing that we see to these vulnerable communities. And it aims to reduce the impact of unhealthy food by really showing that this is a, a, an issue that is not only an issue of um, targeting, but it's also an issue of vulnerable, vulnerability and a, a moral question as to whether it is right to be marketing these products that have an outsized impact on certain communities. So next slide, please. So before we jump into the discussion of predatory marketing, I wanna take some time to talk about how food access varies uh, throughout New York City, just to set the stage for the different stakes that are involved when we talk about what is marketed to which communities. So next slide, please. So here we have two neighborhoods, two zip codes in New York City. Um, some of you may be familiar with them already. We have the Upper East Side, which is the east side of Manhattan, and East Harlem. The Upper East Side spans from Central Park uh, to, and Fifth Avenue to 59th Street and the East River on up to 96th Street. And East Harlem spans from 96th Street roughly up to about 142nd Street, east of Fifth Avenue and the Harlem River, and in between the Harlem River. And the Upper East Side is known as one of the most posh and affluent neighborhoods in New York City. While East Harlem is known for its vibrant culture and colorful murals and diverse communities. And there are, you know, all these communities are really only separated by a few blocks as are most things in, in Manhattan compared to the rest of the country. The food landscape in the respective areas are, couldn't be more different. Similarly, the health status of the people who live in those neighborhoods is very, very different. And you're gonna see on the next slide how they compare. So uh, next slide, please. So looking at the two, we see that, you know, in, all, in the three main uh, health indicators that we have here, which is obesity, diabetes, hypertension, we see almost double the rate in East Harlem compared to the Upper East Side. And, you know, the, when you look at, you know, the high rates of diet related diseases, the higher rates of poverty, uh, higher rates of unemployment status, higher rates of adults without insurance, et cetera. What we see is that we see a, a, a difference that really is almost night and day when compared to um, what you would think for neighborhoods that really aren't that far apart. And um, in 2015, uh, the Pathmark, that was one of the central supermarkets in East Harlem, uh, closed down. And as a result of that store closing down, that created a scenario where thousands of people didn't have uh, access to a, a full-scale supermarket. Now, the intent was to convert that space into luxury condominiums, which is, you know, finally now, almost uh, seven years later, has uh, begun to, to uh, they've begun to break break ground on, on that site. But what we've seen in anticipation for that is a cascade of changes in the neighborhood that have seen supermarkets like Whole Foods, currently a Trader Joe's is under construction in the neighborhood and a wide range of higher end smaller supermarkets and restaurants already starting to move into the area and changing the environment. And what this essentially has done is made it more difficult for the working class and working poor people in the neighborhoods to be able to have readily available access to healthy food. That combined with the higher rates of diet related diseases and the other indicators that we uh, can see on the screen really shows how something like targeting this neighborhood uh, with ads for uh, unhealthy food can have an outsized impact compared to uh, Upper East Side. So next slide, please. <clears throat> So just for some context, here's a, a photograph of a Pathmark. This Pathmark 
uh, has sat empty for um, a little over six years. Uh, this photo was taken uh, last year, so it, it gives you some sense of, you know, not only the loss of that supermarket, but the impact that having this empty building and the impression that having this large empty supermarket, uh, the impression that it gives to the longstanding residents of the neighborhood, you know, that there's enough, um, there's enough economic energy behind this development that they can let it sit for years without doing anything about it. Meanwhile, people's buying habits have had to change and get dispersed among farther flung uh, retail environment, or retail uh, options in the neighborhood because, you know, it's very difficult for uh, neighborhood members in the case uh, that we see here to stop the sort of progress that developers and others in the community has already decided that was that's going to take place. So next slide, please. So in understanding this sort of phenomenon where uh, sometimes a supermarket, like in the case of Pathmark, existed and goes away, other times there was no supermarket to begin with, uh, understanding this concept leads us into this idea of uh, food deserts, which uh, I'm, I'm keeping it in this slide because it's a term that many people are familiar with and has had you know, a, a fair amount of usage over the last 15 or so years, but it really doesn't describe the neighborhoods. And it actually has, to my mind, and I think to many people's minds, there's a lot of uh, changing thinking around this. It really has negative connotations, which on the one hand is, is the intention, but on the other hand, I think it ends up uh, stigmatizing neighborhoods that you know are already dealing with a lot of different things. So, while I use the term food deserts, the more accurate description is a grocery gap. And a grocery gap is a scenario where communities find it difficult to buy affordable, fresh quality, fresh and decent quality foods in a, in a supermarket or grocery store setting. And you may wonder how it can be that a community finds itself in a situation where there's a, a grocery gap, uh, particularly if there's, um, endless amounts of, or what could be considered endless amounts of food options, whether they be corner stores, bodegas, cafes, supermarkets, other fast foods, uh, outlets. And, you know, what essentially happens is that for one reason or another, there's a sense that there's not a demand for supermarket there, but you're not gonna have a community that has thousands of residents that uh, isn't going to require a supermarket. And, while there may be some sense that more money can be made with a higher price supermarket, that still doesn't mean that the people who are long-term residents, existing residents should go without a supermarket. And the sort of twin punch of losing, losing a supermarket, having this grocery gap and being targeted with ads that promote products that are high in sodium, fat, sugar, and that contribute to diet related diseases, again, really amplifies this effect of, um, transforming neighborhoods or, in, or impacting neighborhoods in a way that exacerbates issues related to uh, diet related diseases. So next slide, please. So, and you know, this slide really illustrates uh, the sort of related concept of the food swamp that I talked about, you know, not having a grocery store, having this grocery gap, but also having a scenario where you have tons of fast food restaurants. You see in this picture, you have McDonald's next to a Denny's, next to a Checkers, next to a Burger King. Um, and, you know, these types of, you know, retail and food retail environments typically exist in areas that are, again, you know, the least um, equipped and the most vulnerable to uh, high rates of diet related diseases when it comes to, you know, having your only main option for food being fast, fast food. Like East New York, for example, and Brooklyn is considered a uh, food swamp. There are 41 fast food restaurants in that community. And food swamps, we know are connected to higher rates of obesity. And when we talk about, you know, neighborhoods being serviced by uh, food outlets, Oftentimes the pushback is that you no, know, there's tons of places to get something to eat. You know, there's a you know, chicken place on the corner, there's a Burger King and McDonald's. But we know that, you know, compared to what more affluent communities have, that's not a fair and balanced way to structure a food landscape and a food environment. When you essentially just have the option of going to a fast food restaurant and eating food that's high in sodium, high in salt, rather, fat and sugar. 
So next slide, please. So this leads me to the main topic of today, having you know, described the setting where you have a grocery gap, where you have food swamps, where you have a, a health profile of a neighborhood that is impacted by high rates of diet-related diseases compared to more affluent neighborhoods that may not be that far away. This is where the sort of perfect storm of factors come into play to make a community vulnerable to predatory marketing. And the food landscape of communities, you know, what type of food's available, you know, when it's available, you know, et cetera, really, uh, really feeds into this idea that, you know, with respect to predatory marketing and marketing around the healthy foods, that these are neighborhoods that this is the sort of food that people want. You know, we're simply giving them what they want. Uh, and I'm, I'm, when I say we, I mean, you know, food marketers, food, food producers, we're simply giving them what they want and letting the consumer decide, setting aside any sort of issue of how this sort of food that we're selling is going to impact that community. And, um, if you were to ask people who live in these communities, they want the same things for their, their, their children, their loved ones that people in more affluent communities do. They want them to have access to healthy, affordable food. You know, they don't want to have, you know, be targeted uh, by food companies for uh, products that are unhealthy. But rarely is that sort of the, the poor desire of people in those communities who are impacted by grocery gaps, food swamps, and targeted by predatory marketing. Rather, rarely rather is the desires their desires for uh, better health for their their friends and family uh, taken into account by marketers next slide please uh, so to break it down a bit predatory marketing is an extension of targeted marketing you talked about targeted marketing a little bit in the uh, last workshop and targeted marketing just as a refresher is marketing that's tailored towards a, a particular, uh, group, and whether it be women, you know, whether it be a particular ethnic group, whether it be kids, etc. And it's the it's this marketing of unhealthy products to certain populations and in neighborhoods uh, that are highly impacted by you know high rates of diet related diseases and, and that are most vulnerable is where we get into the more predatory marketing versus targeted marketing. And predatory marketing is extremely aggressive and utilizes misleading claims and is often very pervasive. You know, for example, we see uh, in uh, many uh, neighborhoods that are impacted by high risk of diet related diseases, based on our research, you know, you tend to see more advertisements for sodas than you do in more affluent neighborhoods, in wealthier neighborhoods. And that's when we say pervasive, that's what we're talking about. You, you'll see more of certain types of ads than you would see in another neighborhood. And I'm, I'm sure many of you have unknowingly been exposed to predatory marketing. And similar to targeted marketing, predatory marketing influences the foods that we purchase and eat. Now, if you've given in, if, if before, we've all done it before. If you, if, you know, we've gone shopping, if you've given in and purchased a product or ate a food item because it was heavily marketed to you, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with you. That's who we are as human beings. We're susceptible to marketing. You know, I know I, I've done that. And, but being more aware of the strategies that companies use to get us to purchase products and eat unhealthy foods goes a long way towards dulling the effect that predatory marketing ha can have on individuals and communities. The unfortunate thing is that many don't know about these strategies and that big food companies use their clout, use their money to make us purchase these unhealthy food items all the time and make it seem like it's natural. What's even more unfortunate is that predatory marketing is you know, seen as a way for uh, food corporations to essentially maximize their sales. You know, that's, you know, ma maximizing their sales is typically the bottom line when it comes to their concerns. They're not concerned with anything else not concerned with the impact of the products or, or rather, or whether a particular group or neighborhoods being disproportionately marketed unhealthy food to. So- Greg, Sorry to interrupt, but what do you think that started in terms of like 
being on a large scale to impact certain neighborhoods with one types of food and then the other neighborhoods with another type of food? Uh, well, you see, uh, there's a number of different points in history where you can uh, say that this, this started. Um, I actually, for the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, I teach the uh, class, I teach a food policy course there to graduate and doctoral students. And I have a module on uh, predatory marketing and counter marketing that I teach. And what I like to point to is the um, emergence of lifestyle marketing, which really only start, you start to see it um, in, the, in the early 1970s. Before that, uh, marketing was pretty straightforward. You know, our product's great, buy our product. You know, there's very sort of, you know, advertising 101. But what you saw in the early 70s is a phenomenon where people started to, whether it be because of, you know, the cultural winds that were blowing, whether it be uh, because of the, you know, life cycle of uh, consumer behavior going from the 19, the early teens on through to the 1960s and into the 70s, people's attitudes about buying things and uh, had become much more questioning. And people started to think about, you know, do I really need this? Or, you know, am I buying too much of this? And uh, corporations across the board started to see uh, significant decreases in sales. And um, one of the ways they were able to get the public back is by uh, changing their approach with the help of uh, marketing agencies to market lifestyle more than really marketing products. So the prime example is the beer, Miller beer. You know, uh, Miller beer started to be marketed as it's Miller time. And the advertisements would just be people getting off work, kicking back, uh, relaxing, hanging out with friends. You barely even saw the beer in the advertisement. And that sort of relating a product to how you view yourself, the things that you do, the things you find important, having a good time, uh, really resonated with consumers. And using lifestyle as a way to market products has become part of the marketing and by extension the predatory marketing playbook ever since. Uh, a prime example would be um, Let's see, uh, Nike, just do it. You know, I guess that's, that's, I mean, that's still sort of old, I'm sure, for the, for the young people who are on this. But it's just like, you know, this, this idea of like, I'm a person who does things. I just do it. You know, I'm active. I do these things. They're not, they're not even talking about this. They're not saying, buy Nike shoes. They're the best. They're saying, just do it. Or McDonald's, I'm loving it. You know, you know you're just, you're talking about, you know, you're loving it. You know, you're not even talking about the food. You're just talking, you know, you see the commercials people are having a good time, you know, doing lifestyle things. So again, it's marketing a vision of, of yourself as a happy person, as a person who's fulfilled, as opposed to the specifically marketing a product. So 1970s, I, I would say, is when you first start to see the emergence of this lifestyle marketing. And out of that, you know, you start to see more targeted and predatory marketing, ultimately. Craig, I'm wondering, kind of tied into what Corey asked, um, I mean, I think if I'm being honest, I'm getting a little mad, like upset because I'm wondering when, like when did people, when did these companies decide that specific communities are who they're going to target? Because um, I'm thinking that if you're in a neighborhood with a food swamp and the only thing that is accessible and affordable to you is cheap and healthy food, um, and there is no healthy food, or if that healthy food exists, it's not affordable. Like, who made this decision that more affluent communities would have more access um, and less affluent communities deserved the unhealthy, cheaper versions of, of everything? Um, well, I mean, I don't think that it was one, it one company or one uh, advertising agency. I think it was a sort of organic process. I think a, a lot of it comes out of um, perceived notions of who wants what, where. So for example, uh, when I worked for the Department of Health, New York City Department of Health, I oversaw a program called Shop Healthy. And that program uh, works with corner stores, bodegas and supermarkets to identify healthy products that, already, that they already carry and find different ways to market those products within the store. Uh, and you know, during that job, I really, uh, really had a, a great opportunity to dig into uh, marketing techniques and the, the ways in which uh, 
manufacturers, distributors, and retailers marketed new and existing products, why stores, you know, had certain layouts, all these different sort of the ins and outs of what it is to for marketing, placement, and promotion. And one of the things I found interesting is, um, you know, a, a restaurant like Subway. Subway has what's called a health halo. A health halo just means that people expect it to be healthy, even though, you know, the vast majority of food they sell, you know, you most people get unhealthy versions of it. But people say, oh, Subway is healthier than McDonald's or it's healthier than um, Taco Bell because you see them making the food, you know, it looks relatively simple, et cetera. And um, Subway has what's called, when it comes to the, the non-sandwich or, uh, well, maybe non-sandwich is not a good word, the, the food besides sandwiches, they sell, I say potato chips, they have what's called a planogram. And the planogram is just simply the way that the distributor or the manufacturer says, when you put these things on the shelf, this is the way that they should be set. You know, Lay's potato chips on top, Doritos on the second shelf, um, you know, hot, che hot Cheetos on the third shelf. Everywhere you go, you won't, this is how it's supposed to be in order for you to carry these products. Now, what we were trying to do is to get baked potato chips into these, uh, into subways and into uh, stores, uh, supermarkets, corner stores and bodegas and have those marketed and promoted. And talking to one of the, um, salespeople who come in, the salespeople are the ones who do the stocking. And sorry, this is getting long winded, I'll, I'll wrap it up. You know, I was saying, you know, I see baked chips available at other subways, subway restaurants in the city, but I don't see them in this neighborhood. And he said, oh, this neighborhood has a different planogram. And I found out that that's the case that many distributors have different planograms for different neighborhoods. So a distributor may carry the same healthy product or may carry a healthy product that they offer in one neighborhood, won't offer it to another neighborhood because the perception is, and this is based on talking to the salespeople, is that people don't buy those things here. They're, they don't expect to have those things here. So it's irrelevant whether you wanted them or not. The perception is that you wouldn't buy them so they don't even stock them there, even though they could very easily do so. So, and I use this anecdote to say that I think it's more of an organic process that is arrived to based on people's uh, biases and preconceived notions about who wants to eat what and and what's going to be the sort of thing that's going to appeal to people in a given area. Does that make sense? All right, I'm not, I'm not hearing a, a yes or a no, so I'm going to assume that that, that makes sense. Um, all right, next slide, please. So one of the features of uh, predatory marketing uh, is, you know, marketing that is misleading. And predatory marketing uses um, a number of tricky techniques like this. You know, as you as was discussed in the first workshop, claims that are misleading and make products seem healthier than they really are are, you know, really one of the more sort of egregious examples of how marketers use sort of play fast and loose with the truth in order to sell you their product. And you can combine that with a, a approach that's saturating a neighborhood or that, you know, has an overabundance of these uh, ads that are misleading in the neighborhood. That's where you get both the, tech, the misleading technique and also the predatory marketing technique of uh, saturating a neighborhood with misleading advertising. So, you know, phrases like refreshing, natural, no artificial flavor, which from a, a health perspective mean nothing, you know, but they tend to give the products in many people's minds, the same concept of a health halo. When you hear those words, you hear natural or refreshing, you think, oh, this must be good for you, or at least not so bad for you. But that's very misleading. This uses, that's when a, a company is using misleading language in order to make you think that something is healthier than it is. So next slide, please. Another feature of predatory marketing, again, is this pervasiveness. I just talked about it. Uh, you know, pervasiveness, again, just means that something is widespread or that a, a location is saturated with a number of ads. So again, same example. You see an ad for Arizona iced tea that says, Arizona iced tea is refreshing and no artificial flavors. And every block you go on, you see these ads. You know, those are, that's a predatory marketing technique, using the misleading term, using the pervasive marketing and targeting a neighborhood if it's the case that it's a neighborhood that is affected by high rates of obesity, diabetes, 
et cetera. And pervasiveness is something that often we get numb to. You start to see the same ads all the time. Uh, you tend to filter them out because they've become natural to you. But someone who doesn't live in your neighborhood comes and says, man, there's a lot of ads for, you know, menthol cigarettes here. There's a lot of ads for, for sodas around here. And, you know, many of us often um, who live in neighborhoods that have this, we, we tune it out because it's something we see all the time and it becomes an expected part of the landscape, which is something that uh, marketers and uh, food manufacturers are depending on you to, to uh, transition into to transition to this thinking that this is normal. So next slide, please. Uh, another feature of predatory marketing is uh, aggressive marketing. So aggressive predatory marketing involves targeting a specific audience, whether it be children, adolescents, particular racial or ethnic group, parents, and or and or low-income individuals. And when you think of the word aggressive, you know, we think of, you know, something that's in your face, that's relentless, that is really sort of coming on strong and, you know, something that's forceful, harmful, rough, hostile, in your face, you know. So prime example would be like a giant billboard that says, you know, drink Coke, you know, it'll make you feel better. Or I'm just making up that tagline, but you know, or every bus shelter, you see these giant posters of LeBron James drinking a Sprite, you know, that's aggressive marketing. Uh, and aggressive marketing together with pervasive marketing and misleading marketing, you know, all these techniques bundled together under the guise of predatory marketing go a long way towards, again, changing people's perception about, you know, what sort of food is for them and what to expect when they go out shopping. So next slide, please. So typically we have uh, breakout groups when we do this uh, training workshop module, whatever you want to call it, um, in person. But I've been on a number of uh, virtual uh, webinars, workshops, et cetera, over the last year and a half. And I don't find that the predatory, that the breakout groups work <laughs> virtually very well, uh, particularly so we have a small group. So I'm just, we, don't have much time left, but I, I'm free to, to stay as long as you have questions. And I, I, I'd like to just more jump into discussion mode here and ask you, you know, where do you see predatory marketing? And now that you know what predatory marketing is, you know, what do you think? You know, how does it make you feel when you think about the sort of products that you see marketed like this? And I also want to talk a little bit about, you know, how you think counter marketing based on the workshop that you uh, participated in last week, how do you think counter marketing can help spread the awareness of predatory marketing in communities of color? So I'm gonna open up the floor to uh, this discussion and also any other questions that you may have. So. Um, Craig, I'm gonna invite you to feel free to call upon folks. This is also just a wake up call for everybody. Those of you who might be focusing somewhere else. Um, please come back. Uh, yeah, feel free to just call upon anyone because everybody should be tuning in and listening. Okay, so uh, get ready. I'm calling on Medina. Medina going once. What was the question? The question was, uh, now that you know what predatory marketing is, you know, we've talked about the different features, you know, the aggressive, aggressive nature of predatory marketing, using misleading claims, the pervasiveness, how neighborhoods are saturated in predatory marketing um, advertisements. Now that you know what it is, how does knowing what predatory marketing is and when you, how does it make you feel and how if at all, has it influenced your food choices? Anyone else can also jump in if you have thoughts on the questions. Absolutely. It's a free for all.
usually people get pretty uh, wound up about predatory marketing. So I'm surprised you guys aren't more uh, more aggravated when you hear about this. Okay, so Medina's typed something. Uh, Medina says, I think it explains a lot of what's going on in NYC, especially, and makes me want to shop locally instead of falling for fast food. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, exposure to predatory marketing does is that it, like I said, it gets people angry and it gets people upset, you know, as to why, you know, this sort of unfair or inequitable approach towards uh, marketing is being put in place. You know, why, why is it something that's acceptable? Why is it something that, you know, corporations and marketers believe it's okay to do? Particularly when we see the outsized impact that this sort of approach has on exacerbating the problem of diet-related diseases in, in neighborhoods that are most vulnerable. Oh, I can share. Uh, I live in Central Harlem. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know, there's a large, especially where I live, 130, oh, don't need to know where I live, but especially in the neighborhood where I live, there's a large group of uh, uh, African-American folks and a lot of folks from the African diaspora. And um, at least what I see when I walk up my Adam Clayton, which is the avenue I live close to, there's a lot of fried chicken places. Um, and sometimes I feel like the thing that stands out to me is like the huge fried chicken signs. Um, and I think there is a, there's an assumption that because uh, fried chicken is, is soul food and is related to like um, Southern cuisine and African-American cuisine, that it's, it's something that folks would be um, tempted to buy. Uh, and which people are, I think it's, it's nice to be able to have fried chicken. Oh, sorry, don't know what's going on. I don't have to make it, but I think um, you can use counter marketing in the sense that I remember being at a talk. I'm sorry, the fireworks outside. <laughs> anyway, I remember being at a talk and talking about um, how there's a difference between like celebratory soul food and um, like everyday soul food. And I'm wondering if that talks about like um, fried chicken not being an everyday food, but like a celebratory food so that it's not something that folks think that they can eat every day. Mm. Absolutely. And the context in which uh, the food is being sold, presented, etc., is a an added factor when it comes to understanding uh, the difference between just simply targeted marketing and predatory marketing. You know, if again, the pervasiveness uh, the, the messages that we see, you know, essentially making this sort of food in the case of what you're talking about, uh, seem like an inevitable everyday thing, as opposed to a sort of a more celebratory thing, a more sort of, uh, a thing for an occasion. Absolutely. Uh, Fatou Mata said, when I think of predatory marketing, I know that 149th street a place in my neighborhood has so many fast food restaurants. And of course, and so of course it has a lot of fast food advertisements around. It makes me feel as if that's the only thing around my neighborhood I can turn to, although it's unhealthy. And uh, Tanzilo says, I feel like predatory marketing is more common with fast food. I heard Manhattan has like 74 McDonald's locations. Uh, yeah, I mean, fast food, I think is the one thing that comes to our mind when we think of predatory marketing. Uh, or most immediately comes to mind, particularly when we're talking about food, but we also see, um, you know, sodas, sugary drinks, and also alcohol um, um, as two of the main, also two of the main uh, products, category of products that are, uh, that utilize predatory marketing. And um, I, I'm going to be a little bit provocative here because I, I I like to do it, uh, this and sort of ask, you know, are there any people in the in the chat who think that, you know, having being able to eat fast food, being able to eat unhealthy food, um, having you know marketing of these foods in neighborhoods is an issue of consumer choice. That it's up to the consumer to be able to decide whether they want to eat that or not. It shouldn't be up to 
you know, public health officials or researchers like myself to tell them, you know, you have too many of these restaurants in your neighborhood. There's, you know, uh, the marketing of this unhealthy food is too much in your neighborhood. Uh, does any, anyone have a sort of uh, support the counter argument that, you know, it should be an issue of individual choice and individual freedom when it comes to what you eat and what sort of restaurants are able to open up in your neighborhood? And we have a, a couple of, uh, before you, anyone, if they want to answer that, before we get to that, let's see, we have another couple more uh, comments in the chat. Uh, Medina says, also, I went to high school in Jamaica, Queens, and there were about 50 different fast food places between two blocks and not much grocery shops. But near my college on the Upper East Side, there's, it's a lot harder to find these fast food places. And Tanzila says, I think it's based on convenience. If there was more fast food in my neighborhood, I would probably eat more fast food. Which is true. Convenience goes a long way towards affecting uh, what we buy and why. But uh, again, any any thoughts on uh, consumer choice and personal freedoms and the ability to be able, people to be able to buy what they want, the ability of restaurants to be able to sell and market what they want as long as it's not against the law? Does anyone think that you know? Um, I threw I threw in a comment there about. Um the claims that you talked about, like healthy, fresh, natural, like none of those are, they're not really regulated. And so they're claims that folks can make without any, like without having to prove anything um, compared to something like if somebody says they're organic, they have to have a license and they, they can't just say that they're organic. Um, that, I think all of that makes me think that if the companies were being honest about their products, then I would say, okay, it's maybe people's choice. They have all the information that they need to make a correct choice. But there's, I feel like there's this illusion of, um, like the illusion of free will means that you have all the information you need to make a choice, but there isn't actually real. And like there isn't, I, I feel like the information is skewed. It's not true. And um, folks don't often have all of, all that they need in order to make the right decision. So I don't think it's personal. It's not, I, I don't think it's only personal choice that we should consider. I think um, large companies are also being very smart and sneaky in the way that they are <laughs> reaching out, in the way that they're, like, they're targeting communities. So I think if all of that wasn't happening and it was truly, like if, if companies were truly altruistic and looking for the good of people, Maybe I could say personal choice, but in this case, there's a lot of information that folks don't have. Well, and if you had access to those choices for real. Exactly, I was about to say that. If, if, if there's only fast food, that's not really a choice because you're sort of, you only have only one choice, so you don't have the other side of the coin. So I'm, I'm gonna put on my libertarian hat here and say, you have nutrition fact panels on, on food that's sold in packages. In New York City, you have menu calorie labeling where the calories are on the menu also i was so going to mention the calorie thing actually yeah. that's an also, interesting one because it doesn't give you any interesting or information about what those calories consist of and whether or not they're empty calories or whether or not there's any nutrition in that food right but they also have a salt shaker next to it for items that are high in sodium so at what point does the individual become responsible for their their own choices. If you give them all this information and they do nothing with it, why is it the responsibility of a corporation to essentially hold their hand all the way through the process mm -hmm. of making decisions that inf the information is readily available for them to access and to exercise free will? But I think there's an assumption there that folks understand nutrition facts and yeah. um, calories and things like that. Um, I honestly think if they had like a traffic light, like green for good and red for don't eat this. Um, just if they were most, <laughs> I mean, no one would ever put that in there. The food lobbies will never, never <laughs> prove that. But I think I, well, I, I think coming from a nutrition background, I under, I can understand what the labels mean, but I think that's a huge assumption for, for people who have no, um, who have been like studied a lot of nutrition 
um, which is like folks who who oh, are in science. Yeah. I, I put my libertarian hat back on and say <laughs> it's a huge assumption that to think that people don't understand. Uh, people have you have an apple pie and you have an apple. You can tell a five-year-old which one is healthier. They're going to know that the apple is healthier. People are exercising choice. If a, to use the apple pie analogy again, apple pies can be, you know, particularly the ones that are sold at, at green market. If they're still selling pies, there can be natural. You know, you advertise as natural pie. Is that healthier than a salad? No, but someone is. It's not a lie that it's natural. It's a whole food product for the most part. It's not highly processed. It's not ultra processed. So they could say minimally processed, natural apple pie. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with someone exercising their choice to eat apple pie versus a salad or an apple or a soda in moderation? Where do you draw the line? It's a good question. Well, I don't, I, I mean, <sighs> Moderation is the key word here. Uh, anything in moderation is fine. And the problem becomes when this types of foods become your daily routine, uh, just like sugary drinks in teenagers. Uh, it's so easy for them to grab a bottle every day for a snack. Um, I think that's where it becomes a problem, not in you know eating in McDonald's once in a while. Okay, there you go. There was everyone was frozen for. About 10 seconds there. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, yeah, we can hear. Okay, so I, I didn't did anyone respond to my to my there's question? a bunch of chats. Yeah, I was gonna say there's a lot going on in the chat. Yeah. Um let's see. Well um let's see here. I think the last we, we was with Tanzilla. He says, I think it's based on convenience. If there were more fast foods in my neighborhood, I'd probably eat more fast food. And then Medina Champion said, it's also the prices. They make fast food more accessible and cheaper and healthy, and cheaper than healthy and nourishing food. Uh, Giselle enters in and says, I feel like we, don't, we, we do need to know how to control where we eat. But if there are multiple fast food places in a single neighborhood, it feels like it's the only option. Tanzilla joins in and says, um, usually healthier food is more expensive or harder to find in certain communities. Fatumata agrees, I agree with Medina. I heard other countries, the healthier food is cheaper. Um, I'm from Uganda, very true. It's really expensive to buy um, McDonald's in Uganda. I think a bucket of KFC is $100. Um, Wow. So yeah, it's it's for rich people essentially. So it can really affect how uh, what people go to straight when they're buying food. Giselle says many people are not as educated on the food label labels, so they don't understand. And Craig put on his libertarian hat and said that that is an assumption. Uh, I would like to see the data on that. Uh, and Medina says because of the companies, companies are the ones who have gotten people hooked on fast foods and these sugars in in the food, when you tell people this information, they won't understand and they won't have any resources to change it. And finally, Tanzilla says, I think this has a lot to do with cultural norms. For example, in my family, we have a culture of eating homemade food instead of outside food. Hmm. Uh, I have an, an anecdote um, that connects to that last comment. And uh, since we're over time, I, I don't want to I want to be respectful of everyone's uh, time. Um, and this sort of connects some of the comments together. So it's interesting. Uh, when I was a kid, um, eating out, like eating at McDonald's, uh, eating at, you know, a restaurant was seen as a sign of affluence. You know, like, oh, we're going out to eat. We go out to eat. And, and there's a, a great Eddie Murphy sketch from his first, I think his first comedy album where he, he talks about how um, all his friends are getting McDonald's and he goes to his mom, he's like, oh, I, I, I wanna get McDonald's. My, my friends are getting McDonald's. He's like, you don't need McDonald's, I'm gonna make you a burger. And he's like, mother starts making a burger and she's taking out pepper and onion. And he's like, well, there's no pepper and onion in McDonald's hamburger, what, what are you doing here? And she's like, oh no, I'm, I'm making you a, a better burger. And she chops up peppers and onions and put all the spices in it, and, like makes this huge ball, you know, fries it up and then puts some like, plain white bread on it, all the grease on it. It's just this ball of bread and 
and, and meat. He takes it outside. He's eating it while his friends are eating McDonald's. He's eating this, what he calls a house burger that's just dripping all over the place. And I, I, I use that skit to, to say that, to reinforce this idea that again, there was a time when going out to eat regularly showed that your family had money. You know, we could go out to eat, we go out to McDonald's, we go out to Burger King or whatever. But sometime over the last 30 years or so, it switched. Now having the time to be able to go shopping, you know, at green market, to go shopping at farmer's markets, to have time to prepare food, to have time to explore recipes. Now that's a sign of affluence. And, you know, poorer people, lower income people have been left holding this bag with this, you know, after the shine is worn off of eating fast food and fast food, the price has gotten lower and lower and lower in order to allow more people to be able to afford fast food. It didn't become a sign of affluence. Um, it's essentially reversed. And having the time to cook, having the, the money to buy high quality ingredients and to be able to explore dishes that maybe you don't know or have lost touch with because you know very few people cook, that now is a sign of affluence. And that's really one of the major issues that we face when it comes to changing people's perceptions around you know, consuming fast food versus cooking. That it's something that there are ways to consume fast food that aren't expensive. Are there some whole ingredients that are expensive? Absolutely. But there are ways to eat healthy that aren't expensive. But the perception is that it's expensive and time consuming, both of which are different kinds of expense. One is an expense of time and one's an expense of money. How you combat that, you know, that's something that those of us in public health and who deal with food policy and food systems have been trying to address, you know, for the last 20 years. And I think, you know, no one has a clear answer yet. I mean, I know one way, you know, and this is what we call at the Institute non-food related food policies or non-food policies that relate to food. And one of them would be just to increase uh, wages, give people more money to be able to purchase food. Uh, another would be to uh, change the structure of um, free time, of, of annual leave, of you know, allowing people more flexibility when it comes to work schedules so they're able to cook at home, et cetera. Those are all non-food related food policies, you know, in our mind, so. Uh, and with that said, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I'm happy to answer any more questions uh, if anyone has any. Um, I know we sort of got into a, a lively discussion here towards the end. That's typically the way that it happens. But uh, thank you for indulging my my libertarian my, my libertarian uh, act. It usually gets my students um, riled up. We end up having pretty pretty wild conversations and I just look my class has been trans, uh, converted to an online class since the pandemic and I do a class called food freedom and one of the classes is food freedom and it's on you know the different ways in which the government limits the way that we purchase food so the ability to be able to purchase raw milk or foie gras in New York State and in California or to be able to forage in Central Park you know all these different things and looking at the message board last week it was on fire <laughs> people really get people get bent out of shape about it. And um, yeah, the animal welfare one is uh, pretty provocative too, so. <laughs> That's great, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Craig, Bill. I think, I feel like those are probably questions that um, you all will be hearing in the community. And it's um, a good experience to, one, to like contend with them here in a safe space, um, but also to hear from you and your response to them. Um, Thank you all yeah. for joining. Yeah, and sorry, Craig. One last thing. Feel free to yeah. share my contact information if any of the uh, yeah. folks are on the on today's Zoom call want want to reach out, want to talk more, have any yeah. questions. Happy to to talk and provide any sort of insight or help that I can. Thank you. Actually, while I we have you here, can I ask? Are you still? I know that in the past you have um, gone through this content marketing presentation with youth and train them on how to to have this conversation in their communities. Is that something that you are still doing? Absolutely, uh, once we identify Sharita's replacement. Okay, got it. So how can our youth keep in touch? Well, I'll give them your, your information so they can keep in touch with you. Uh, and they can also subscribe to the newsletter uh, on our website, uh, CUNY Urban Food Policy uh, Institute.org. 
um, and we provide updates uh, through our mailing list and also in our newsletter. Great. And, and again, you can reach directly out to me as well. Awesome. I just shared your contact and I also want to share the Food Hub. Uh, and here's a link to the CUNY Food Hub content marketing hub where you can find all this information. Was someone saying something before I kind Looks of wind like us down? A couple of new, oh, no, sorry, that's you posting my contact information. Yeah, no, that's just a couple of new posts. Okay. Um, I think we have had a really great introduction to content marketing and this has gotten us thinking a lot about, I know when we had Chantel talking about food justice, we started thinking about um, our communities and what is accessible to us and what, um, what, what the context is in the food landscape and the spaces that we work in. And um, I'm hoping that these conversations can continue. And um, we actually talked with the managers. I'll be sending out a couple of questions and um, getting you all to think through how you can take all the information that we've been talking about and the questions we've been grappling with and how you can use that to um, talk to your communities and to be ambassadors as we talk about uh, making local food accessible and the easy choice for people. If no one has any questions, thoughts, I think we can close. Right. Well, thank you again for inviting us to do this uh, series of workshops. We're always happy to 